Hello, this is Rick, and this is Burn After Reading. I want to start off by thanking everyone who watched the last two videos. Thank you for liking and subscribing. The positive comments lets me know that this information matters to you. I would also like to give a big thank you to Roberta Glass, the West Memphis 3 Facts Facebook group page, and everyone who shared my videos. It really helped. It's refreshing to get comments from people who state that they didn't know any of this stuff before. While this information has been made available um, in different forms and media in the past, I'm just proud to keep this information alive. However, one tidbit I'd like to correct on my part. In part one of this series, I said it was Pam Hicks who called the police the night the three boys went missing. It was actually Terry Hobbs who called. So just wanted to correct that. But with that said, let's get on with it. Damien Eccles. It's popularly believed that he was one of the three falsely convicted of murder because he dressed in black, listened to heavy metal music, and read Stephen King novels. It is widely accepted that Satanic Panic was the primary reason why Damien was found guilty. This belief is heavily enforced by the Paradise Lost series, The Devil's Knot book, and a cast of famous people sympathetic to the West Memphis Three cause. They believe that Damien was just a mere depressed, misunderstood bright kid in an ignorant southern judgmental Christian town who scorned him simply because he dressed differently and liked other interests. Now, according to Damien, West Memphis was second Salem, and he was a victim in their modern-day witch hunt. <laughs> okay, now call me crazy, but I'm pretty sure the prosecutors of the West Memphis Three Trials didn't use spectral evidence to convict them like they did in Salem back in the day. Some of you are probably asking, what the hell is spectral evidence? Well, Joan Johnson Lewis of ThoughtCo.com explains it really well. Spectral evidence is evidence based on visions and dreams of actions of a, a witch's spirit or specter. The spectral evidence is testimony about what an accused person's spirit did, rather than the actions of the accused person in the body. In the Salem witch trial, spectral evidence was used as evidence in the courts, especially in the early trials. If a witness could testify seeing the spirit of someone and could testify to interacting with that spirit, perhaps even bargaining with that spirit, that was considered evidence that the person possessed had consented to the possession and thus was responsible. Okay, I'm 100% confident that spectral evidence was not used to convict Damien Eccles, hence voiding the lunacy of this being another Salem witch trial. I'm also certain that West Memphis didn't attribute all other crimes to Satanism. However, what we do see, if we dig deeper, we'll see a violent, disturbed kid with documented health problems along with suicidal and homicidal tendencies. Let's discuss what led up to the murders. All right. On May 29th of 1992, nearly a year before the murders, Damien was arrested for burglary and sexual misconduct after trying to run away with a girl named Deanna Holcomb, his girlfriend at the time. During the arrest, Damien threatened to kill the officer who made the arrest and Deanna's father. Later, Damien told caseworkers that he made a suicide pact with Deanna if they couldn't be together. How Romeo and Juliet. Jerry Driver, a juvenile probation officer along with Detective John Murray, questioned Damien. Damien denied being a Satanist, but he did admit he was involved in the occult. He described himself as a gray witch, um, a witch that is in the middle of white and black witchcraft. Basically, he saw himself neutral between good and evil. Damien explained to Jerry that he did have a group that would meet and that his main participant was his best friend, Jason Baldwin. He also boasted that Jason would never give him up, which was confirmed in Damien's autobiography entitled Life After Death. Jason knew of Damien and Deanna's plan to run away together and was with them part of the day helping them. Damien's violent acts and threats would only get worse. 
In addition to threatening to kill Deanna's father and the arresting police officer, Damien threatened to kill former friend Shane Divilbus, the person Deanna dated after her split with Damien. In school, Damien attacked Shane and tried to gouge out his eye. In Damien's autobiography, Life After Death, Damien denied this act, claiming his finger accidentally slipped and grabbed onto Shane's eye, but his book contradicted his statements in his medical records. In a discharge summary on June 25, 1992, he admits to violence and trying to remove Shane's eye. This is one of many examples of Damien trying to minimize his actions while he was in prison and after his release. He doesn't want the populace to know about the real him or who he was. He wants you to see this facade, this poor, misunderstood guy at the time. Shane would also have some interesting insights on Damien. He claimed that Damien was an, an imposing person and that his friends feared him. He stated that if you disagreed with Damien, his glance could quickly silence them with intimidation. Now, um, Damien also threatened to kill his mother and father. After leaving Charter Hospital of Little Rock in 1992, his parents moved him to Oregon because Pam, Damien's mother, believed that he was into some strange activities such as witchcraft, and she also didn't like the quality of friends that he had in Arkansas. In September of 1992, Damien's parents called the police. They no longer felt safe around their unstable son. Damien made statements that he was going to kill himself and others. He threatened to commit suicide in various ways. Damien also threatened to cut his mother's throat, um, and also made verbal threats to kill his father. In March of 1993, 14-year-old Jennifer Ball stated an incident with Damien. She was in her kitchen on the phone when all of a sudden Damien appeared outside her window, telling her she was going to die. An incident report was filed and is on record. This was a little over two months before the murders. Soon after Damien threatened Jennifer's life, he went to 13-year-old Amanda Lancaster's house to stalk and intimidate. According to Amanda, she stated that Heather Cleet, Jason Baldwin's girlfriend, told her that Damien had been asking about her. He asked Heather about Amanda's phone number and address. After the child murders, Amanda reported that at the local skating rink, Damien would follow her and Jennifer around, stalking them, and threatened that they were the next two to die. On May 24th, at a softball field, multiple different girls heard Damien claim he murdered Stevie, Christopher, and Michael. He went on to say that he planned on killing two more people before turning himself in. He claimed that he already had one of them picked out. Some of these girls include Christophe Van Vickel, Katie Hendricks, Jody Medford, Jessica Medford, Jackie Medford, and Katie LaFoy. Donna Medford, the mother of Jody, Jessica, and Jackie, also made a statement regarding Damien's softball field confessions. Based on the statements before and after the murders, I think it's pretty solid to believe that it's possible Amanda Lancaster and Jennifer Ball may have been on Damien's list. In trial, Damien admitted being at the softball field, but denied making those remarks, calling the girls liars. Years after being long convicted in a prison interview, he admitted that he probably did say it, but it was a joke. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it perjury to lie on the stand? Okay, so Heather Cleet made a statement that Damien told her that he stuck a stick in a dog's eye, jumped on it, and burned it. Joe Bartosh, Jason's cousin, witnessed the torture and killing of the dog. So you have two different collaborating statements that can't really be dismissed or passed off as hearsay. You have one who heard about it and one who saw it happen. These weren't just mere acquaintances or just casual friends. You have one who was the actual girlfriend of Jason Baldwin and one who was his cousin. What purpose would it that be to lie, especially if it hurts Jason at trial? 
Now, a dog skull was found in Damien's house on May 19, 1992, after running away with Deanna. Damien claimed in trial that he and his stepfather found it on the side of the road. Now, some will say that the dog killing is conjecture, and fair enough, but consider these two things. Damien's lies, and how he minimizes, versus his actual track record. Weigh the two out. What is more plausible? It should also be noted that days after being arrested for the murders of Stevie, Michael, and Christopher, Damien attempted suicide on June 9, 1993. He hoarded medicine he was supposed to take daily while in jail. He consumed 12 pills at once. He left a suicide note. He was then placed in a holding tank until proper authorities could be notified. An ER doctor advised they give Damien a syrup that would help him vomit out the medication. Um, you know, this really just shows you that this was a, a person who not only was homicidal, but was suicidal and was mentally not well. I would like to go back to how Damien stalked people. As previously stated, he stalked Jennifer Ball and Amanda Lancaster, be it at their homes or out in public. Here's an interesting statement Jesse made to Detective Ridge. He talked about how Damien had a briefcase. Um, in it was drugs and photographs of the boys in front of a house. Now, let's stop there. Let's see if we can see a connection. See if it's... Let's just see if there's anything outside of Jesse's confession that can validate this. Now, Melissa Byers, the mother of Christopher made a statement to police on October 5th, 1993, regarding a man taking pictures of her son in front of her house. Let me read it in her own words. Sometime around last of February 1993, or the 1st of March 1993, my husband and myself went down to the corner grocery flash market on Ingram Boulevard. We left Ryan and Christopher home. Christopher was playing out under the carport, we returned about 20 minutes later, and Christopher came outside telling us a man had taken his picture. When questioned about it, Christopher told us the man had on a black coat, pants, shoes. He also had black hair. I asked him if the man talked to him or tried to grab him. He told me no, however, the man scared him, and he ran into the yard to get away from him. He told me the man took his picture, got into his car, and left. He told me the man had a green car. Now, this is where West Memphis Three supporters will say that Damien, you know, doesn't know how to drive or he doesn't have a license, um, at least at that time. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, Jesse also stated to Ridge that Damien would drive Jack Eccles' car. In case you're not paying attention, people have a tendency to do things that are against the law. Now, some will argue that Jack's car was red and not green, but see, these are kind of minor details. We just know that if Damien needed to drive, he could drive. You don't throw the proverbial baby out of the bathwater. So, is Melissa making up a story? Was there another possible explanation? Well, Melissa thought maybe it was someone at the mortgage company at the time, since they were having some financial troubles with their house. They thought maybe someone came to take pictures, so she contacted them to ask, and they responded that they haven't been out there since August of 1992. So that possibility was ruled out. So let's take a look at another incident. 11-year-old um, Jessica Bryant and her parents went to the West Memphis Police Department to report a stalking incident, which Jessica stated happened about two months before the murders, putting it around March. According to her statement, she said, It was a Sunday, and we were, just, we were just running around talking to each other, and this boy just came up walking down the street, and he was dressed in all black, and so we were just playing, and we looked over, and there we saw him. He was behind the bush, and so we went, and so we weren't really paying attention to him. We didn't think anything was going to happen, so we continued playing, and then he was still there. So we went over and we hid behind a, this car for a few minutes and we thought, you know, he won't come out. So 
we go away and he leaves us alone and in, we went back and he was still there and so he was looking out of the corner of his eyes at us and so we didn't know what to do so we went inside and told my mama and he started running off and then we don't know what happened to him so let's take all that information from multiple sources we have Jesse Miss Kelly, who stated Damien had photos of victims in a briefcase. We have Melissa Byers, stating her son told, told her that a man all dressed in black was, photo, was photographing him sometime in February or March of 1993. We have Jennifer Ball and Amanda Lancaster, who talked about an incident of stalking and threats in March of 1993. We then have Jessica Bryant stating that she was being watched by Damien in March of 1993. We see a clear and distinct pattern of behavior that you simply cannot ignore. Let's move on to Damien's taste for blood. Human blood. His fetish for consuming blood is extensively documented in a 500-page document called Exhibit 500. The documents are a long list of Damien's mental health records that were presented by his lawyers to convince the jury not to give him the death penalty by persuading the jurors that he was mentally ill. While at Charter Hospital of Little Rock back in June of 1992, Damien would suck blood off of peers who had scratched themselves. In September of the same year, Damien was in the Craighead County Juvenile Detention Center. While there, another juvenile cut his wrists. Damien grabbed the kid by one of his wrists and sucked the blood from the open wound. He then smeared the blood on his face and proclaimed he was a devil-worshipping vampire. He was immediately placed in isolation and suicide watch. Damien stated in, to one social worker that he believed in vampires and that he worshipped the devil. He told another counselor that drinking blood gave him power and that it made him feel like a god. In addition to Jesse's many confessions, others have witnessed Damien's taste for blood. Tiffany Allen witnessed a fight between Jason Baldwin and this other boy. After the fight, Jason bled and Damien wiped Jason's blood off with his finger and put it in his mouth. Damien made it clear during an interview that he doesn't drink blood, but licks it. An irrelevant statement because whether he's drinking, sucking, or licking, he's consuming human blood. Now let's go over Damien's take on the murders. On May 9th, 1993, Detective Brian Ridge and Shane Griffin visited Damien, Jason, and Dominie at the front of Jason's residence. They asked Damien his thoughts on the murders. Damien believed whoever committed the crime was sick and did it as a thrill kill. He said that the penis was a symbol of power and that the number three was sacred in the Wicca religion. He said the murdered boys probably died of mutilation and drowning. He assumed one was cut up worse than the others, and that the purpose of the murder was to scare someone. Damien claimed only one person committed the murders, because if there were more, someone would eventually confess. Boy, would that statement ever come back to bite him in the ass. When asked how the person felt after committing the murders, Damien answered that the person probably felt good because they had the power to do what they did by taking life. When asked why he thought the boys were so young, Damien answered that the younger the victim, the more innocent they were, and that it gave the murderer more power. Damien believed that the killer knew that the kids went into the woods and that maybe the murderer asked them to come into the woods. He said that the boys were not big or smart and would be easily controlled. He said that the killer um, would not be concerned with the screams due to it being in the woods and that the killer wanted to hear the children scream. Damien believed that the killer was local and didn't care if he or she was caught because they thought it was funny. When asked uh, what items the cops should be looking for at the crime scene, Damien answered candles, crystals, and a knife. Now, here is one bit of information that is mind-blowing. 
Damien told Detective Ridge on May 10th that juvenile pro officer Steve Jones told him that testicles had been cut off and someone had urinated in their mouths of the boys and that the bodies had been placed in the water to flush it out. Here's what's incriminating. There's no way Jones could have known that. No one. Not even Chief Inspector Gary Gitchell knew, you know, until May 16th um, when he was phoned by Dr. Frank Peretti, the state forensic pathologist, and was told urine was discovered in the stomachs of two out of the three boys. There's no possible way Damien Eccles could have known something so case-specific. Um, how could he? I mean, how could he but not Chief, Inspect not Chief Inspector Gitchell or the detectives? It's absurd on its face. Damien's take on the murders was eerily similar to what happened at the crime scene. Um, he would be questioned at his trial by Prosecutor Brent Davis. When asked where Damien heard about the details, he claimed he read about them in the commercial appeal. Problem is, that information was never in the commercial appeal. Davis accused Damien of changing his explanations to conveniently fit the circumstances, and Damien agreed. Damien was constantly changing his story. Now let's get into Damien's alibis. Damien claimed that he was on the phone with several girls that night. He claimed to be on the phone with Dominique Tier, Heather Cleet, Holly George, and Jennifer Burden. Although he did talk to these girls that night, the time frame doesn't create a compelling alibi. Damien claimed he talked to Holly that evening. That's not true. He talked to her in the afternoon around 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. Damien claimed he talked to Heather, but it wasn't until 10.30 p.m. he told her that he was walking around with Jason. Damien parted ways with Dominique around 5 o'clock or 5.30 p.m. The next time she spoke with him was around 10 p.m. Damien spoke with Jennifer sometime after 9.20 p.m. However, it's quite possible it was a little later than that. Before, Jennifer called Damien and Damien before 5.30 p.m. and she stated that Damien told her that he and Jason were going somewhere. Mm -hmm. She called Damien's house at 8 o'clock p.m. and was told that he wasn't home. Later, Damien changed his story and claimed that he gave his mother instructions to tell her he wasn't home because Domini was over. Based on Domini's accounts of where she was that night, she wasn't with Damien during that time frame. So who's lying, Damien or Domini? Domini was firmly behind Damien throughout the investigation and the trial, so there's nothing for her to gain by lying in her statement. Diane Tier, Domini's mother, would also confirm she arrived home at 7 p.m. So far, what we could take from that is that Damien was with Jason. So from 5.30 p.m. to after 9.20 p.m., but possibly later, Damien implicated himself along with Jason by telling others he walked around with his best friend that night. This contradicts his statement that he was on the phone with them during the time frame of the murders. Here's an interesting witness testimony. At 9.45 p.m., the Hollingsworth family, who knew Damien, testified that they saw him walking near the crime scene covered in mud on the night of the murders. They claimed Dominique was with him. Now, it's fair to point out that the Hollingsworth family, I think, mistook Dominique for Jason. They had long, similar hair, they had the same build, and it was dark, and they were described as muddy. Besides that, multiple records state Jason was with Damien, so that's the one constant we have. In addition to Damien's lies, Pam Hutchinson, his mother, claimed that he was with the family during the time frame of the murders. She claimed that they all had supper and then went to um, a friend's house. After that, they returned home and Damien was there the entire night, talking on the phone from 7.30 p.m. to 11 o'clock p.m. Pam claimed one of the people he spoke to that night was Jason. However, Damien also claimed he was with Dominique and wouldn't take Jennifer's phone call because of it. Dominique certainly doesn't remember, so what's the truth here? Again, the story changes in order to help Damien. Here's an example of Damien admitting when cross-examined by Davis. So Davis states... 
Your mother testified that when you were down at the police station, one of the things she told you was, you got some alibis, correct? Damien responds, yes. Davis asks, she testified that the same day the police talked to you, or maybe it was your sister, that that is when you first started discussing, discussing along with the family about the details of the alibis, correct? Damien responds, yes, sir. Davis asks, when the police talk with you on the 10th, at the point in time you tell them from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. is when you think you were at the Sanders. Is that right? Damien responds, I probably told him that then. Davis asks, that was about five days after the boys had turned up missing that you told them it was around 3 or 5 p.m. Damien responds, I probably told him that if it's in the report. Davis asks, when your mom tells him something, it's about 5 or 6 or 5 or 6.30, okay? Damien nods his head. Davis asks, as the time moves on and the time period that is in question becomes later in the evening, the visit to the Sanders becomes later in the evening, correct? Damien responds, yes, sir. Davis asks, so the story kind of changes to fit the facts we need to cover, right? Damien responds, yes, sir. It is clear that Damien and Pam are not being truthful because all four girls Damien claimed to have talked to that night didn't occur around the times he, ch he claimed. So who's lying? The four girls or Damien and Pam? Is it responsible to believe the girls lied? Dominie was Damien's girlfriend and the mother of his child. Heather was Jason's girlfriend, so what would her motive be? Jennifer was very close with Damien. Holly was friends with Damien and Dominie. Again, what's the truth? They can't all be true, yet all are presented by Damien as evidence for an alibi, which all falls apart. Okay, let's talk about if Damien knew about the Robin Hood Hills crime scene. In prison interviews, years after his conviction, he told multiple interviewers he lived in Marion and not West Memphis, which he said was about 15 to 20 miles away from the crime scene. He told interviewers he didn't spend a great deal of time in West Memphis unless it was to go to Walmart or the grocery store. He claimed not to be familiar with the Robin Hood Hills location. Let's see if his comments hold up. Damien, in fact, lived in West Memphis, and in fact, testified in court he lived at the Broadway Trailer Park in West Memphis, which was within two miles of the crime scene. Damien also testified he walked in the neighborhood about two to three times a week. Also worth noting that Robin Hood Hills was the halfway meeting point between Damien's residence and Jason's. Perhaps the most compelling part of his lies is the fact that he lived at the Mayfair Apartments as a child for a time that overlooked Robin Hood Hills. He even talked about it in his book, Almost Home. You know, going back to the Hollingsworth family, 16-year-old Tabitha Hollingsworth told Detective Dabbs in an interview that it wasn't unusual to see Damien and Jason at the location of Robin Hood Hills. She described them often walking around 10 Mile Bayou, the large body of water which ran under the pipe bridge. She said they go back there to the river all the time. It is, I mean, the fact that the media and West Memphis Three advocates overlook this is nothing short of embarrassing for them. Damien clearly lied as much as he is able to to minimize his involvement to the point that it's not even clever but painfully obvious. How does someone overlook this? Okay, so let's talk about Damien's criminal motivation. Was his influence a cult motivated or simply a thrill kill? Maybe a mixture of the two? I believe the state prosecutors overplayed the occult or satanic ritual side motive, but let's understand proof of motive is not required in a criminal prosecution. In determining the guilt of a criminal defendant, courts are generally not concerned with why the defendant committed the alleged crime, but whether the defendant committed the crime. However, it may not be completely baseless that Damien had an occult motive. 
Let's talk about child sacrifice and Aliester Crowley and how that relates to Damien Eccles. Damien denied being into black witchcraft and claimed to be either a white or gray witch, but Deanna claimed her ex-boyfriend lied about being a white and gray witch. Um, she stated that he was very much into black witchcraft. Perhaps Deanna's most disturbing statement was this. I ran away with Damien. I went to a hospital in Memphis, and he went to one in Little Rock. I found out that he planned to kill our firstborn if it was a girl. Damien would not do it. He is too much of a coward and would have tried to get me to do it. That's when I knew he was nuts, and I had nothing else to do with him. I met Damien at school. I read some of his poems, and I felt sorry for him. Deanna saw Damien as too much of a coward to commit murder, but apparently his intent of having others to do it was certainly there. Little did she know, he was fully capable of being a participant. Chris Luttrell, a Wiccan and a friend of Damien's, stated that Damien had planned to sacrifice the baby of another girlfriend, Dominique Tear, but decided against it due to getting a bigger government check due to his social security disability. With the murders of Stevie, Christopher, and Michael, and the talk of sacrifice, it is important that we address one of Damien Eccles' greatest influences, Aliester Crowley. Aliester Crowley, an occultist, practiced magic of sex, drugs, and sacrifice. Crowley was known to the occult and was fascinated by blood, torture, and sexual degradation. Here's a few statements Crowley made about child sacrifice. Um, th just two highlights from the book Magic in Theory and Practice. He writes, For the highest spiritual working, one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. He later goes on to state, But the bloody sacrifice though more dangerous, is more officious, and for nearly all purposes, human sacrifice is the best. Now, apologists claim that Crowley wasn't literally speaking of sacrificing children, but was referring to masturbation. However, it was a claim that Damien would not dispute in trial while questioned by prosecutor Brent Davis. In trial, Davis asked Damien if he knew about Aliester Crowley, Damien answered that he knew of Crowley, but knew very little about him. Davis told Damien that Crowley believed in human sacrifice, in which Damien responded that Crowley also believed he was a god. An interesting response, since Damien claimed to know very little about him, and in one of his own writings, he claimed that when he drank blood, he felt like a god. Davis asked Damien if he knew that Crowley found children to be the best type of sacrifice. Damien agreed. Davis then presented him with a piece of paper with Damien's handwriting. On the paper was translated coded alphabets. On it was the name of his girlfriend, Dominique, his best friend, Jason, his infant son, Seth, and a man he claimed he knew very little of, but didn't know much about, Aliester Crowley. Davis asked Damien when he translated the coded names. Damien claimed it was before his arrest. Brent asked him if he was sure it wasn't while he was in jail, and Damien timidly responded that it might have been. Again, Damien continues to get called out on his lies. Davis asked Damien if he translated the alphabet codes while he was in jail, and Damien meekly responded, If you say so. Damien would eventually admit that he translated the codes while he was in jail. Damien knew he was called in a lie after being so arrogant just minutes before. The names Damien translated all had some importance in his life. Dominique was his girlfriend, Jason was his best friend, and Seth was his son. To have their names listed along with Crowley and to claim that he had no influence, it just didn't add up. Years later, in Life After Death, Damien would admit how influential Crowley was and still is in his life. Crowley was heavily into black witchcraft and attempted to summon demons and other spirits. He didn't believe in God or Satan, but, you know, that didn't make his beliefs and actions any less disturbing or evil. 
Damien would go back and forth on the whole devil worshipping aspect, but he confirmed he was involved in demonology and believed in the power that blood had, especially when consumed. Again, Damien said that he consumed blood and it made him feel like a god. He also claimed to be possessed by a spirit of a woman murdered by her husband. Interesting correlations for someone he knew of but didn't really know. On March 19, 1994, Damien was convicted of three counts of capital murder and sentenced to die by lethal injection. In conclusion, Damien would create a self-fulfilled prophecy. In his progress report, Damien stated that he could be another Ted Bundy or Charles Manson. In the same report, he stated that he wanted to influence the world. At the end of Paradise Loss, the childhood murders at Robin Hood Hills, Damien said that at a young age, he knew people were going to know who he was. He enjoyed his newfound fame because he said even after he's dead, people would talk about him forever. He basked at the idea of parents telling their children stories about him as the West Memphis Boogeyman. He relished the idea that children would fearfully look under their beds, thinking he might be under there. Damien loved the attention of the trial. He blew kisses at the parents of the murdered children and smirked, sneered, and licked his lips seductively at onlookers and the media. Patricia Liggett, Damien's aunt, recalled a time when he told her that the one thing he wanted more than anything in the world was to become famous. Well, Damien got his wish. He was covered by the media and a documentary series that highlighted his trial and aftermath to the entire world. He became famous and not only did activists and a croupy wife fall at his feet, but so did celebrities, filmmakers, and musicians who invested their money to set him and his two other friends free. They spent possibly tens of millions of dollars to hire the same forensic experts who got O.J. Simpson and Casey Anthony off of murder convictions. Damien has a following that could rival the cult status of Charles Manson. The difference? Damien was freed, while Manson, who also maintained his innocence, rotted for the rest of his days in captivity. In August of 2011, Val Price, Damien's original defense attorney, was asked if he thought his former client was innocent. Price squinted his eyes, shook his head, and said that it was hard to say. A very interesting statement coming from a man who defended him back in 1994. Today, Damien is living the American dream. He's a New York Times best-selling author. He recently wrote a book on magic. He has credits as a movie producer. At one time, he tattooed X's on groupies for, for a fee. He got to rub elbows with the likes of filmmakers Peter Jackson and musician Eddie Vedder, and that's just to name a few things. Christopher Byers, Stevie Branch, and Michael Moore don't get to live a dream. Their innocent blood eventually gave Damien the fame he always wanted. What could be more tragic than that? What could be more outrageous? Is that justice? Yeah, just a misunderstood kid with eccentric tastes. Bullshit. Until next time.